Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Uh, welcome to Asia School of Business. This is our first webinar in a, in a series. Uh, as you can imagine, this is a very interesting time for all of us. So uh, um, I really appreciate you being here. I hope the traffic on the way to this webinar was okay and you didn't get stuck into too much of it. Um, allow me to give you an introduction. Uh, my name is Loredana Padurian. I will be a panelist and a moderator for, for today's session. And together with my guest, uh, Mr. Lil uh, Lung Yen, the CEO of Citibank Berhard, and my colleague, Professor Michael Fries, Professor of, of Management, we're inviting you to, to join us in this conversation. We would like to think of it more of a dialogue. And um, I'm gonna take notes throughout this, throughout this process. Uh, we will ask you kindly to mute your mics, um, mute your videos, and type the questions in the chat box that you're going to see there. I'm going to try to capture as many of the notes in, in the comments and uh, keep everybody happy. Now we have a, a screen of Professor Fries, who's, who's with us, and I will invite uh, uh, Mr. Lung to also turn on his camera. So uh, before I do that, I just want to take a moment to say that this is a really, really interesting time for all of us. And... Uh, uh, I think uh, even a month ago, let alone two months ago or three months ago, who could have imagined that we live this reality? And uh, I know a lot of people are saying that it's very hard to work from home. Uh, I have to say myself, I thought Zoom was fun in the beginning. Now, after having eight minutes of eight, eight, eight meetings of Zoom every day, I think, hmm, maybe not so cute. But uh, uh, I hope we all realize that we are the lucky ones. We are the very, very lucky ones who can be here, who don't have to be on the front line who are not medical workers, who are not policemen, who are not grocery people, who are not people who have to, who have to sacrifice every single day of their well-being for this. So I would like to ask everybody a favor. For the only time in this webinar today, I want, if possible, everybody to turn on their cameras and turn on your audios. So if you can oh, to understand more about the camera, on your so camera. You're, you're understanding about the camera. What I would like us to do together, I would like us, we're going to okay, take a little video. Okay, okay. Uh, talk to anyone about Oh, I'm not that brownie. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Oh, hello. Semua orang cakap. Kau suruh semua orang cakap. Ah, itu lagi dia. Kenapa orang tu cakap? Mute your cameras. Thank you so much. Mute your mics and mute your cameras. What? You've got to finish this thing. So let's let's get started. And uh, uh, the uh, the format of this uh, this uh, meeting will take place as as follows. Um, because we're trying to have a very simple uh, format, we will have two questions for each speaker. Uh, maybe two um, uh, two questions of four minute each. Uh, we will also take four or five questions from the audience. So once again, please type uh, your questions in the chat box. We will select your, your questions. Uh, and then, like I said, please turn off your, your mics. Please turn off your cameras. I really appreciate seeing everybody. Nice red t-shirt. I can see one lady right now wearing one. Beautiful beach image, but let's not get distracted. Uh, and also, um, we were told by multiple uh, um, telco suppliers that the networks this day is very unstable. So what we would love for you to do is do not interject in audio and video throughout the webinar, um, but type the questions in, in the box. And remember, there's always a technical error, so I have a feeling we're going to have at least one today. Is that okay? All right, so let's get started. I, uh, I also typed the questions on the screen so people who cannot hear as well 
they can see this. We're gonna start with Mr. Lung, the fabulous, the well-known, the extraordinary Mr. Lung, who's a friend of CD, a friend of uh, ASB for, for a long time and the CEO of Citibank. So um, I can only imagine, uh, Lung, that you had a really complicated journey in the past couple of weeks, right? So uh, you talk a lot about leaderships. I've seen, I've seen you speak in your public speaking engagements and you're an amazing speaker. But can you tell us a little bit um, and try to use maybe real examples? How did your leadership change in sure. the immediate term? Well, firstly, uh, thank you for having me on. Um, I, it's always a privilege to speak at ASB. Um, it is an honor for me to be here today. Now, um, you know, I've, I've been through a couple of crises, right? I mean, I've been with Citi for 30 years. And so I've, I've seen quite a few Asian financial crises, the global financial crisis, and then now this one, right? Which is a, a big, big, big one, pretty much similar to SARS, but this is a lot bigger. Uh, one of the things that I've realized and learned over the years, right? And these are for um, all managers should, should, all leaders should, should think about this. Um, I've got, basically about five things that I, I look at and, and that things that I've changed uh, and be more focused on. The first one is um, in situations like these, where it's, you know, we're very VUCA, right? Volatile, complex, uncertain, complex, you know, ambiguous world, right? Um, we set, or I've set very clear short-term objectives. Because if you think, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of the year, right? So for me and my leadership team, the first thing I've done is short-term short objectives. Uh, what used to be a month or even a year out, your strategies, it's now daily and weekly, right? Set timelines that are clear, quantifiable. Um, we do that uh, every day and we have to track them. So that's the first thing that, that I have done, right? Whatever needs to be done, it's daily, it's weekly, right? The next thing is the teams that we work with. You know, we use the term war room. Now, war room sounds great, right? Yeah, like everybody getting there, everyone trying to solve the problem. But let me tell you, big war rooms like you see in movies, right? Where the general you know, commanding his troops, it doesn't work in situations like this. I used to have a 16-man management team. Uh, I still do, but when it comes to uh, decision-making and all, my teams are now tactical. My daily team that I work with is a four-man team. My ONT head, my uh, service head, uh, a senior operations officer and myself. And we meet twice a day. Um, and why is this the case? Um, very simple term, right? If you have too many cooks in the room, you get confused. There's too much information coming in. Some of them, you're not sure whether it's real. So in situations like these where decisions need to be made, you know, how many people work from home, what sort of equipment people need, um, you need to be nimble. Things are fluid. Bank Nigara comes out with a new policy. How do you distribute that? Uh, decisions need to be fast. If you've got, you know, 15 people in the room, everyone having an opinion, uh, it's going to be very difficult. And for myself, uh, I need to be able to uh, hear people's uh, feedback. But at the end of the day, I still need to make fast decisions. It's all, I'll use a military term, right? It's all about command and control. Because if you've got many people saying a lot of things in situations of confusion, um, you know, nothing gets done, really. Everyone's running around in, in circle. So uh, it's important that whatever problem that comes to the table, it's broken up into bite size, uh, break up the problem. We, we a, a common, uh, point that we would make to each other is, okay, we need to make the decision here. Uh, can we meet in three hours time? Everything, all timelines are shortened, right? Uh, I, I had this saying 20 years ago, um, tomorrow is too late. And it, it actually, 
works now, right? You have to have a decision made within the hour or within the day, right? Next thing is making fast decisions, right? In the past, we would sit around the table, debate, everyone has an opinion, and then, okay, I'll think about it. Let's, I'll circle back to you. It's very hard to make that sort of decisions today. You know, you don't have that luxury of time because you would have Bank Negara, for example, who, who is our regulator, they want things done fast because they've got to work with the entire re, uh, uh, industry. You've got out, up the chain all the way up to New York, it's giving directions, how many people working from home, what sort of equipment you need done. Everything needs to be done fast, shorter timelines. Everything has been compressed. So I will have to make that call. Now, the other thing is this, whatever decisions that I've made, and I've made many decisions over the last two weeks, or two, actually six weeks, uh, may not be perfect, right? But what happens is that the journey that you go along, you refine it along the way, all right? So that's very important. Another thing that I've done over the last six weeks is to over-communicate. It's very important because staff, now City runs a team of about close to 5,000, right? Staff still need to be loved. Now, majority of people are working from home. They need to know they are still part of the team, that they are not forgotten, they are still loved, and that it is important that they feel that they are still contributing. And that's very, very important because everybody's working from home nowadays, right? So they're isolated. They don't hear what's going on. In the past, information used to come through, through formal channels and informal channels. So for me, you know, I communicate at least twice a week. I send out an email telling what's going on. I've got the ONT head communicating as well. So HR also sends out mails, reminders. So it's very, very important. It's important that whatever fake news that's out there must be able, you must be able to distill it, right? What is fake news, what is real, and then communicate. And then last but not least, you know, not necessarily with the bank. When you're in a war room or in a situation of crisis, um, you've got to use things that are not out of the norm. You've got to think outside of the box, alternate solutions, right? So, you know, if, if in the past you used to get uh, your tech team to put together a program, to program something for you, they would take three months to get it done for you. That's not going to happen in a situation like this, right? So, you know, if you can go out and buy something out of the box that does not uh, compromise security, does not compromise uh, data privacy, use those things, right? In times of war, you've got to use things that are um, what, at your disposal. Now, um, the other thing that I've also done is, um, so I'm, I'm also part of Motorsport Singapore, right? So I've got a staff that's been working with us for 20 years. She's been doing the same thing, does it very well for the last 20 years. So I said, close the office because no one's coming in. Oh, but then what about people who need to collect their licenses? They come in and go, I said, you know, there's this simple solution. Have you heard of this thing called the mail? So, you know, <laughs> we would send out like, and she looked at me and says, oh yeah, it's such a simple solution, right? But sometimes we forget, we get confused because there's a lot of things going around us. So, you know, those five things that I, 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 I needed to change myself, um, to change my leadership style a little. Um, yeah, so over back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I took a lot of notes, but I'm going to, uh, to pass the, uh, the mic to Professor Fries. And um, like I said, you're, a, you're an expert in leadership, in crisis, psychology. Um, what immediate adjustments should companies make in their leadership strategy to adjust to this crisis? And I think Mr. Lung already addressed some of them. He talked about five things. So I'm going to ask if you can talk about five things from your perspective that they should do. Uh, and again, I'll take notes. Let me just send a reminder to everybody who's listening in. Please turn off your mics, turn off your, your camera, and we will take questions at the end. So type on the side box. You will see a type uh, a, a chat box. Type your question. I promise uh, my, even our president is typing questions in the, in the box, so we will get to you. Professor Fries, what do you think? Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Young, you, you were already so good, uh, it's very hard to add something to that. Um, I think the major issue is indeed the time perspective. But let me, let me come back to, um, the, to some of the uh, scientific literature on, on reaction to crisis. And one of the uh, bigger problems is that typically organizations start to develop a threat rigidity cycle which means the following, you're under threat and you immediately start to constrict control. you start to, as you also say, because of time constraints, you centralize many things and you forget the emotional side of the problem. And I think you were very, very nicely said that people still feel loved, need to feel loved, uh, by the organization, by you as a CEO. And I think that's extremely important because you're so much oriented towards the problems as a leader in this situation that you sort of forget everything else and you constrict. And what you typically do is of course, you go with your first intuition and usually the first intuition is good, but it can be wrong because the first intuition is, of course, that we say we have to concentrate on the problems only, and we don't have to concentrate on the problems for the organization only, and we don't concentrate on the problems that individuals have. So what do people feel in a crisis situation? They feel confused. Um, there's nothing that works anymore in the same way as it used to. Um, everything is new. Um, Loredana was telling me that I should really get used to WhatsApp now from now on every second of the day. Um, I hate WhatsApp. Um, so the point is we have to start to change the way we do things. So in a way we are now under time constraints in an organizational change situation. And one of the biggest things there, and uh, you already alluded to that is we make a lot of mistakes. Everyone makes a lot of mistakes. The employees, the leaders, and we have to be, in a way, it's an exercise in humbleness, in mm. humility. Um, this is very strange because you actually want, in war situations, you want a non-humble leader. You want somebody who says, I can do anything. Yeah. Uh, but in principle, you want somebody who can say, oh, I'm wrong. I don't know the answer yet. But at this moment, we are trying this approach. And I think this is very, very important as a leader and as leadership in general and as manager. But what do you think, uh, Loredana, in terms of your entrepreneurship background? What, what do you think is important from an entrepreneurial perspective in, in, in yeah. this situation? Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for those questions. And actually for the comments, you gave me a little bit of goosebumps when you were talking. So uh, when, when Mr. Lung started uh, talking about his, uh, his strategy, short-term goals, um, quantifiable and trackable, short teams, uh, fast decision-making, uh, hear people out, but make decisions and make them fast, uh, over-communicate, uh, think outside of the box, I was thinking, are we teaching a course in entrepreneurship? Because that's exactly what we tell startups to do. And that's exactly what startups do. That's what, what young companies do. They, they, uh, they have to do that because they don't have the rich resources that very large companies like Citibank, Kazana, you know, uh, Bank Negara have. So they have to think very short-term goals because they actually don't know what tomorrow, if they have a tomorrow is going to look like. Um, most of the time, these people, the, these companies have a, uh, to have a very small people team, right? So there's a limited number of resources there. So as I was reflecting for the past couple of days about this, uh, this situation, I, I realized that having a strong entrepreneurial mindset will help a lot of these companies. And, and to go back to, to Michael's points, which I, which I took, um, I wrote down, it's also this uh, people centricity versus problem and system centricity that, that matters a lot, right? Um, people still need to feel love. I love the way you said that, Nung. Um, and love is, um, uh, actually, I'm going to bring that up in the next question that I have for you, Michael, when we talk about the, the psychology of people. But I think there has to be a, a centricity towards people. Um, maybe um, find ways to uh, revise a lot of the processes that we have. 
um, I'm driving myself uh, and my team crazy these days because I constantly tell them, do we have to have 17 steps in this process today or can we make it four? And actually one of uh, my very, very beloved colleague who's a former student of ASB said, can we make it a one step process? And I was like, wow, is that, is that the most intense and uh, you know, ambitious goal ever? But yeah, maybe it's not a one step process, but maybe we can reduce it from 17 to, to five. So my, um, my perspective is that companies that are very, very large and they are used to work in this uh, um, very planned, very complex, very sophisticated environment, almost like a tank ship, if you want. I use that analogy on my research. They have to lear learn how to go back to the basics. They have to remember what it was like to be a, a nimble, small, limited in resources, young company, and find that entrepreneurial energy and harvest that energy to move forward. So, um, let me, uh, since we talked a little bit about entrepreneurship, let me go back to, uh, to uh, Lung, even though you covered some of these things, uh, thinking a year ahead from now, and I don't know what this year is gonna look like. Uh, there's a lot of discussions that uh, the, if everybody takes um, extreme measures of, of social distancing, uh, we will see a slowdown in the, uh, in the, in the COVID uh, impact. But they also talk that like every other flu, like every other virus, it has a, a cycle, so it might come back. So without really thinking about that, how corporate leadership will change, let's say a year from now yeah. on? So um, let me think. Um, you know, this crisis is going to hit everybody. And I'm saying everybody very hard, right? So what we are doing now is actually going to be a test of what the future holds and how we do business going forward and how leadership will change. Give me an example, webinars. What we are doing now, let me tell you, this is the first webinar I'm actually doing in my entire life. <laughs> All right? So, and I won't be surprised that I will be asked to do more right? Um, because as companies struggle to make profits and all, they've got to find alternate ways of doing business, of communication. So for sure, more video conferences, more video conferencing, more phone calls, rather than flying around the world. Yeah. That's for sure. Okay? Because we are living it and I've been living this the last six weeks. I've done more video conferences right, across the globe than I have in the last 30 years working. Right? So this is going to be the norm. There'll be less face-to-face, -face, right? And more will work from home. Yeah. Now, with more people working from home, you will realize that um, office costs, right? Office costs are always very high and if someone can be just as efficient at home as, com and as compared to being in the office why not work from home so you know I, I see that as a big change as well another thing is companies will be investing more in technology I, I've for one now I've got this home set up here Right, video. I'm trying to think, oh, how do I get my voice more crisp? Right? Do I need a better mic? And this is for myself. Um, so I think companies will invest more in tech to help people communicate better because I think it'll be a lot cheaper than flying around the world. Um, yeah. One more thing I think companies will take their COB continuity of business your BOP testing more seriously, right? I, th I think in the past, everybody, uh, you know, just went through the motion of uh, testing, right? Your continuity plan. Oh, you know, you've got a, a alternate site. You send people, 10 people that, yep, the phone's working. Yep, the, con the computer's working. Okay, we're done. Yep. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so. I think all these things will change in the next one year. So, so let me uh, let me stop you here, um, and we'll we'll go to to Michael next. But 
I just want to reflect a little bit on, on um, uh, something that you said and stimulated the thought. Every time I'm supposed to have a meeting in the prior to COVID, I was supposed to have a meeting with a corporate client. They would invite me to their office or they have me uh, uh, or they would visit my office. Uh, I had a, a bunch of meeting with startups and they would just send um, web links for webinars. And I'd be like, why? why? And they said, I'm sorry, but we don't really afford to go all the way to your office. And we don't really have time to socialize after this meeting because we're really like struggling to make the best out of every single minute that we have. Yeah, and, and money, right? Because money, yeah. startups, they can't just burn cash, right? So they need to be efficient. And another observation that I have is, uh, actually, it's, it's a lot of comments that I see on social media where they say, so it turns out that meeting in person now can be a web, a web meeting that web meeting can actually be an email. That email now can actually be a short email with a fast decision making. So what I see, it's a change in, it's a change in behavior. And since Michael is, is talking about behavior a lot in his work and he's actually uh, assessing the psychology of people in a crisis, Michael, a year from now on, the same question to you. When we go back to an equilibrium, whatever that equilibrium looks like, uh, what do you think the reality, the economic, the social, the healthcare reality is gonna look like? Can you put on the video uh, because my video was turned off? Yeah, I think somebody's going to help you with the video, but we can hear you well. So go ahead. Okay, good. All right. So um, um, I think this is um, uh, in, in a few years time or in a year's time, we will probably look back and it will be a, a situation where we will ask the question, has the company done well, well enough? under these circumstances. So it's, a, a, in a way, a, a trial period in which we all are in, uh, whether we have actually dealt with the situation well enough under the circumstances. Um, and again, people will sort of think this was an awful time, but there were also many things that were positive. Um, feelings of solidarity, feelings of, being together in this situation, et cetera. Also the kind of help that you uh, were getting uh, that may have been surprising to you. So the question then is, can you look back and say, we have done really well as a company. And I think this is the best, the best and most important issue that we have to talk about. The second um, important issue is that we will, um, indeed use the uh, procedures that we have right now and so new technology, et cetera, webinars, um, all these kinds of things will be much more frequently used from now on. Um, the last point that I want to make is, and I don't know whether you can see this, uh, but I made this, uh, my, my uh, colleague of mine made this uh, for me when I gave talks in 2006, 2007, and 2008, and 2009 on the economic crisis back then. And I thought this was really interesting, the idea that the same name, the same concept for crisis also means danger and opportunity. And I think this is the way we have to think about this whole thing. Now, obviously, at this moment, we concentrate on the survival issue, on the issue of that this is often a life and death issue. But we also have to think back of the trial and of the opportunities that gives us. Thank you, Michael. Um, I wanna make a, a comment to something that Michael said about people will remember how their companies dealt with this crisis. So I wanna give you two examples. One of them is very personal. Uh, one of my best friends works in New York. Uh, and she works for a bank, for a very, very large bank. And uh, they had to start working from home about 10 days ago. As everybody knows, New York is one of the hotspots of, of the um, COVID. Uh, um, and uh, the memos that they got from their companies was that, well, since you're working at home now and you have, uh, you have plenty of time, we're going to increase your workload by almost twice as much. We expect everybody to be on video calls at all time. And we're going to extend your working hours because everybody has to pitch in and, and, and do more. Now, um, I don't really know who was in charge of making that decision without really considering the fact that, yes, you might be working from home. But if you have kids, which my friend has, um, your kids are also from home. 
uh, she said, uh, we're working now pretty much from 7 a.m. until 9 p.m. And I have kids crying around me who are telling me, mommy, why can't you play with us? Mommy, why can't you make us lunch? Mommy, you're home. What are you doing here? So she was telling me, I can't wait for this to be over for me to resign and find a more humane company. And I was thinking, probably the, the rationale for having these people work overtime is because you're afraid that if they are at home, they don't work. But then why are you afraid that people don't work when they are not at home, in the office, right? So that goes into a bigger question. I There's think- There's a bigger think, psychological issue around this yeah. whole homework. Uh, and I think that makes perfect sense, yeah. And then I've seen another example, I'm not gonna name the company, but uh, I've seen a, a recent case where a company did a massive layoff and the way they did it was by sending a robocall um, uh, to the employees who got a, a, a link to uh, uh, join a webinar on Zoom. And when they linked on the webinar, they were told quite unceremoniously that they are fired and their services are not, no longer needed in effective immediately. Now, um, Michael and, and Yulung, both he talked about the fact that people still need to feel love. And I feel like one of the, uh, the things that will make companies survive or not in this time is how do they reach back into their humanity uh, account? How will, we all understand that cuts will have to be made, uh, people, resources, physical, et cetera. But I think it's how do you do that that will matter. Um, I, uh, I wanna say one of the great things about the ASVs the day before we went on lock lockdown, our HR and finance did the impossible and send out paychecks, uh, I think 10 days in advance because we all knew that we're gonna have to deal with this. So I really want to see if there's anything that, uh, that you guys can advise company in terms of this humane or humanity lens to do. And then I'm gonna open the floor for questions. I already have a lot of questions here from, from the audience. So I'm gonna pass that to you, but any final comments from or yeah. advice on how, how we can increase this humane or humanity uh, uh, lens? Sure, uh, let me go first. Um, you know, like all crises, it will pass. It will pass. How we behave, how we conduct ourselves now, will be remembered. If the crisis is for six months, let me tell you, if we make bad decisions, bad people decisions, we will be remembered 10 years down the road mm, yes, for the decisions yeah. that we made, right? Empathy, respect for staff. Even in points of crisis, we need as leaders, we need to be able to control ourselves. Because that's one of the things, right? There are different types of leaders. There are the leaders that are really cool under pressure, right? <laughs> Nothing phases them. Then there are the other types of leaders that just freak out, right? Start screaming because they cannot take the pressure and they take it out on staff, right? So I, I advise all um, leaders, managers, supervisors, before opening your mouth, chastising the staff, take a deep breath. Understand what the other side is going through at that moment. Because everybody is in this crisis together and everybody is under pressure. Everybody wants to do their job. It's just that the circumstances around them have changed. So as leaders, take a step back, take a deep breath, make sure you listen, show empathy, show respect, your staff. Thank you for that. Michael, any comments to this? Um, I think the general idea is um, put yourself into, as you said, put yourself into the shoes of, of your employees. Now, whatever you are doing, and I agree with that, is going to be um, sort of a test of, of how is this organization, how is this leader going to do? in general. I think in, in addition, what you have to think about is what, how can you reduce the negative affect, the negative fears, the negative feelings that are around because of the fear of COVID? How can you uh, sort of make sure that people are not 
constricted in their views because of this fear. And I thought I heard a very nice uh, uh, song today uh, by, by a guy um, uh, uh, whose name is Prince Ye. Um, and he said, uh, be, um, be aware, be careful, but don't panic. So try to make this small difference between the panic and, uh, and be at the same time aware of the dangers that exist. And I think once you have done this differentiation, you are going to be a bit better able to actually work through the situation. And can you help as a leader? Can anybody help as a leader? Yes, you can by always making this differentiation that yes, we are in a negative emotional state, but yes, we also have to think of how can we deal with the problems at hand. Thank you, Valve. Uh, I wanna comment a little bit to this too. It's true, we are in a negative state, but um, I think in every situation, one of the things that I love about Asia is the, the principle of yin and yang, right? There's, there's a dark side, there's a light side. And uh, one of the things that I see today happening is in this darkness, there's so much, there's so many examples of extreme humanity. There's so many examples of people helping other people without any reasons, but just because they were there. Um, I think, again, I wanna go back to uh, my comment about um, companies who will show respect, like you said, who will show humility, who will, who will show respect to their employees will truly gain on the long term. Because yes, you might have to lay off some people right away, or you might have to reduce some, some of your resources right away. But like every cycle, like every crisis, we will go back to the top. And those who will go back to the top with a good, um, if you want, uh, emotional positive investment, in the, in the people that they couldn't keep in the long term, they will be the, longs who, the ones who win. And we have so many examples. Like I have a lot of, uh, 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 I've done a lot of work with uh, some of the automotive industry and the automotive industry is constantly going through these cycles of depression and then success. And a company like Toyota, for example, who has been extremely positive in keeping their suppliers um, engaged and supported in crisis, continue to show very successful uh, uh, sus financial sustainability on long term. So uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to ask Professor Fine to, uh, to maybe select some of the questions. As I was listening through, we have literally dozens of questions uh, anywhere related to uh, the loss of job, um, bringing a workforce for, from retirement, uh, how do you communicate effectively? But I'm going to ask Professor Fine uh, if you can use your uh, audio, Charlie, and read some questions. For those of you who don't know, Professor Charles Fine, uh, or as we call him Charlie, he's our president and dean. He took this uh, very challenging task of selecting some questions. So, Professor Fine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Laura Donna, and thank you to the panelists for contributing to this program. So there are a lot of questions that have come out, and I'm uh, trying to group them a little bit. There's a whole set of questions about work from home. And the work from home questions, uh, let, me, let me put them into the following categories. How do you manage people working from home? How do you measure the, the work that people are doing from home? And how do you maximize the productivity of the people who are working from home? So how do you manage them? How do you measure them? And how do you maximize the productivity in this situation? Uh, let me start. Um, we've got quite a few people working from home. So we know what their job specifics are. Uh, I have at my, in front of me, I've got a traffic light, right? Which 28 different departments, which we consider critical. So a traffic light, whether it's green, orange, or red. And these different departments are tracked on their productivity, right? So if it's, for example, city phone, you know, the calls coming in, where you're supposed to pick up the calls X number of seconds and all. Uh, we track all that. Everything is quantified. Whether or not you work from home or in the office, this has always been the case. There are trigger levels. Uh, there are uh, service level agreements, which we track. And everything's quantifiable. So every day, uh, a mail sent out to um, the managers, of these di different di divisions, 
uh, who will gauge based on their own service level agreements, trigger levels, uh, to come back with a traffic light, whether it's going to, you know, if it's 80%, anything dropping below 80% goes to amber, all right, goes to orange. So on our side, we track everything. Um, and that's the way we've always done it, both whether you're at home or at the office. Can I make a, a comment to this, Charlie? So um, a couple of uh, months ago, first week of January, actually, right after we came back from, uh, from some of the winter breaks, uh, I was in discussions with two very, very, very large companies in Malaysia. And it was a very honest discussion. It was a very uh, uh, informative discussion for me. And one of the questions that I got in both meetings was, Prof, can you tell us what is this whole thing about digital transformation? There's so much talk about it, like, but do you think we really need it? I mean, what if my company says we don't need to go through digital transformation? Like, why do we have to do this? And I said, you actually, you're right. You don't have to go through this, but just so you know, it will go through you. Um, and I feel like if today anybody has any doubts that digital transformation is a reality, uh, and digital transformation means creating systems, plans for managing a workforce that works from home or measuring the performance that works from home or setting up like Loom said, setting up systems that allow you to have a mobile workforce or understanding how to make decisions in a much faster uh, uh, hybrid way. I think that everybody has to face the reality that digital transformation is happening as we speak. No, absolutely. So let me give you an example, right? Um, if, you know, I, I'm not sure how many people are on this webinar at the moment. 340. I, how many? 340. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's amazing. You see, that's the thing, right? Take this, for example, right? You could never get 150 people in a room, right? To pull them into Sasana Kijang, right? Or Lanai Kijang. Yeah. But you can get 350 people in this time of crisis because of technology. That's one, right? And if I were to ask the 350 people in this room, how many... How many of you have actually walked into a bank, a branch, to actually do banking? I would say only a handful. Most people would do their banking online. You can transfer money online. You can do it on your mobile phone. So that digital transformation, you know, has already happened in many industries. Right? So to your point. Thank you. Um Michael? Um, I think it's important. Uh, not everyone is, of course, um, in the same situation um, as you are at Citibank with extremely um, quantifiable types of, of performance indicators. So quite frequently, people have to sort of organize their work completely new of when they start to work from home. And I think uh, the example that you gave, Loredana, was an interesting one of your friend in New York. So we have to sort of uh, ask the question, how can you actually make it better for yourself? How can you be more productive for yourself? And I think one of the big issues here is that you have to develop new routines, that you have to be very clear uh, what are the routines? And given the fact that we are, uh, that we are lock on lockdown, um, it is actually um, even more important that we know um, uh, that we are a little bit in a situation um, where we need to, uh, you know, like if, if you were in prison where you have to really make sure that you have your own routines and that it's not just... Um, uh, something that is completely only determined by the outside world. And that, I think, is something that individuals have to worry about. Now, the second point is um, uh, that, of course, the more you have quantifiable uh, uh, parts uh, to your, to your uh, work performance indicators, the better and the easier it is. But we also have to worry about to make everything quantifiable because often we know that there are certain kinds of things where it's not quite true that we can um, that we can know that it was precisely done in the type of, in, the, in terms of quality and in terms of, of the human factor. Um, 
as, uh, as we think it was done. So this is an issue. So we still have to talk about intrinsic motivation um, in this situation as well. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking, as you said, Michael, that we need routines. Today, it's the first time in two weeks I had to put on makeup. And mm -hmm. I was like, huh, that completely changed my, uh, my day, right? So uh, let's take one more question. Uh, Professor Fine, if you can find a really good one. Uh, we're scheduled to finish right away, but uh, I would suggest if we can stay maybe for 10 more minutes. For people who are online who have to, to leave, thank you so much. Just keep in mind that we will have a recording of this session that we will share with everyone. So uh, Professor Fine, give us a really good question. Yeah, so this other question I think is very rich. It, it refers back to the references that uh, several of the panelists made about wartime versus peacetime uh, processes. And, and the question was, and that maybe that relates to entrepreneurialism as well. But the question is really, well, if, if wartime uh, processes are so good, why don't we do them all the time? <laughs> why do we even need peacetime processes? And uh, what can we learn from this for not only for the wartime that we're in, but for our ongoing way that we uh, organize ourselves and work in our, in our organizations? <laughs> Okay, Michael, you can go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you're very generous. <laughs> you want me to go first. Usually you have a woman who takes up all the hard uh, questions, right? First. <laughs> well, anyhow, so I, I do think um, that we have to be very, very clear that we cannot continue with only uh, uh, homework and working from home. We cannot do that. We can also not only work for the next few days and make decisions for the next few days and under time pressure. We can also not work under this kind of pressure where we only worry about the next few, uh, the survival of the next few weeks. This is not going to be healthy. So we have to also come back to a sort of peace type work environment again. And the peace type work environment, of course, is to some extent that we meet again people. Um, there's no way that we cannot have the human touch again. There's no way that we can completely get rid of the kind of, of, of human interactions that we have in a, in a, in a common meeting room, etc. Still, of course, we will be much more working through new technology. I agree with that. Digitalization will happen more. I, yeah. I agree with that a lot. I think uh, if anything, and this could be my very entrepreneurial nature, we can learn a lot how to be faster and better and more uh, effective. Uh, I grew up um, in, um, in East Europe. I grew up during communism. And to be honest, the, uh, the past two weeks, this reality reminds me very much of, of growing up in a controlled society with uh, uh, rationalize everything. Uh, I have to admit my house is nicer these days than it was uh, a couple of that decades ago. But one of the things that we learn in my, in, my, uh, in my childhood during communism is how to make the best out of nothing and how to maximize a very, very limited number of resources in the best way possible. Lung, do you want to comment, have a final comment of the day? And then maybe I'll ask Charlie to, to comment something since he's been listening so attentively to all this? No, I, I think I agree with everybody, what everyone has said, right? And we need to come to a balance. I don't think one or the other works full time for everybody. I think a balance will, will happen. Uh, we will learn from this wartime experience. I'll just use that analogy. This is wartime experience. We will learn from it and we will come out better. Uh, we will uh, pick the things that made us stronger. We will develop better systems. We will share. And uh, because like Michael said, I think the human touch, you know, I've been working from home for the last, what, 10 days, 15 days, and hardly speak to anybody, right? Mm -hmm. I'm out face to face at least. Mm -hmm. Right? And I probably won't be for another two weeks till this MCO is lifted, right? So that human touch during peacetime, I think, is something that's missing. And as I mentioned before, people need to be loved, right? It's very hard to love somebody 
over a video. <laughs> I'm sending everybody love, just so you know, you are still <laughs> love people. <laughs> Charlie, do you want to say something before we wrap it up? From your experience, I mean, you, uh, we, uh, just for everybody in the audience, just so you know, Professor Fine is an expert in operations and supply chain management. At some point, we will have a, a webinar where we talk about how do we uh, design resilient supply chains and how do we address the challenges that we have in terms of procurement, delivery, et cetera. Charlie, do you want to say something related to that or not? So, yeah, in fact, there's a question that says, what about the people who can't work from home? For example, transportation of goods, passengers, supply chains, what's the solution for that? And I think, as we know, the government has said, there are some industries that are critical and need to continue to run. And one of them is food supply chains. So all the way down from the farmers in the field uh, to the truckers who bring the food to the warehouses, to the supermarket uh, shopping uh, service providers, that's a supply chain that can't work from home, but that has to continue to work. And the government has to support the, the health and well being of all the people in that chain because if any one link in that chain uh, breaks, then food won't make it into your home during this time period. So uh, we do have to spend a lot of time thinking about how to make sure that those chains work. And not, not everything that we need is, can be done by work from home. And so we're, we have to focus on those as well. Thank you, everybody. I think uh, we're, we're actually uh, six minutes uh, past time, but uh, maybe because it's, we've been talking about love, maybe because we're missing other people uh, on, uh, on, a, on a screen, but uh, this seems like the time was, went by really quickly. Um, I want to say uh, before we before the conclusion of this event that obviously all, all conclusions are temporary and I learned that from from my my uh, mentor and my president but I want to say this is a great time of uncertainty and stress um, on many dimensions and uh, I was actually wondering who is alive today that can have all the answers that we are looking for and probably it's mm -hmm. going to be very hard to think of, of one but I think collectively we can develop strategies that can work for individuals organizations and nations. And I think we see so many case studies around us of not just individuals, but how nations are taking over and taking control of what's, what's happening. Uh, I wanna thank everybody. ASB is committed to being part of, a, of this process and being a positive contributor. Keep in mind, this is the first time we are doing this ourselves. I was telling my team this morning, I've never been so nervous being on screen in my life and I used to work in media, but there's something about this webinar feature uh, stay tuned for more information about the upcoming events, and I'm going to leave this screen here. I would encourage everybody to uh, take a shot of this uh, this uh, code. Send us some uh, some uh, some uh, uh, if you want topics of interest that you might have. Uh, stay in touch with us. I promise that by the end of this week, you're going to hear at least three or four more seminars that we might put together in the next upcoming weeks. If you have an interest in doing so, uh, Professor Michael, so good to see you. Uh, I know we only talk once a week uh, when we meet in person, but I feel like in the past uh, two weeks, we talked a lot more. Um, Mr. Lung, as always, you're fabulous. I'm so sorry that you cannot drive your fast cars on the, on the circuit, but you drive at the same speed of light even when you work from home. Uh, to the entire team of ASB who put this together, and especially many, many, many thanks to Dr. Tan, who is the creator of this, uh, this uh, web series, who's the brain of this, uh, this process and the entire team that help us figure out how to do things overnight, how to log in, how to send links, how to stay connected. Thank you so much. Just so you know, we have over 300 participants. Uh, we had over 150 questions. So thank you so much, everyone. Sending you all much love, stay healthy, stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>